has been some criticisms of the rational planning model um, because of the consequences that it had in communities, um, but because of many other um, reasons um, that are more uh, in terms of like the logic of it. So one of the criticisms is that uh, problems are really, really wicked. Um, meaning that there's no one right or one simple solution. The idea here is that knowledge is really limited. We know what we know uh, as individuals. So if I'm a, a, a technician, I'm going to know very well what I'm doing, but I will not know um, what other technicians are doing. And even then, uh, with collaboration, it will still be very hard to have all the knowledge. So in a way, collaboration is definitely uh, better than just making decisions on your own because you could not possibly have um, all the information that you uh, would need. Uh, by the way, this is actually an argument for uh, free markets um, that uh, if the state controls absolutely everything, it's going to make a lot of mistakes. If you have different players and different uh, stakeholders making uh, decisions that agglomerate to uh, the market, for instance, then um, you will have um, a better uh, system. Um, but going back to this idea of like rational planning, um, the idea is that planning is too complex, it's too big, it has too many um, moving parts, um, and it happens in a highly uncertain um, environment. So something could happen that it really changed the rules of the game, and you really have to um, change um, in order to adapt. So planning needs to recognize um, that. And finally, critics argue that there's no single public interest and that there are many publics, um, but most times these um, have really like competing interest. Uh, more specifically, there are academics that offer uh, criticism uh, to rational planning, social Paul Davidoff, Judith um, E. Ines, and Charles uh, Limdon. Uh, you will learn about these planning thinkers actually in your planning theory course, but um, I am going to just briefly introduce them uh, to you as it's like relevant to this idea of criticizing rational planning and therefore criticizing um, how rational planning uh, approaches actually community engagement. Um, so uh, Paul Davidoff, he criticized this idea of like the rational comprehensive planning process, um, which was like the dominant paradigm in the 1960s and the, 60 and the 70s, uh, because it really assumes that planning uh, do not argue for um, against anything or in favor of um, anything. So he was saying that planners uh, should be more like um, lawyers in the sense that they should have uh, values and they should represent uh, a specific client. Um, so if you are a lawyer that um, seeks the rights of tenants in tenants and landlord relationships, uh, you might defend that tenant and advocate for that tenant and seek that that tenant has uh, more rights in comparison um, with the landlord. But you might choose to actually be a lawyer for the landlord and um, just like uh, seek for more rights for the for the landlords because maybe you think that um, the landlords uh, are getting abused by the uh, current law and regulations um, and they cannot uh, make money so they will go out of business um, if, if for example there's a policy like um, rent control. So the idea here is that um, you as a planner can decide who to represent and that you definitely have interest and that the community themselves they also have um, interest. Um, so let's think um, about uh, the same example that I give about rent 
uh, renters and landlord relationships, but in terms of our planning, we could say um, that a planner could choose to represent um, homeless individuals that are um, staying downtown, um, while there might be another planner that might choose to represent the business owners. Uh, for the business owners, it's not good that the homeless individuals are panhandling um, outside or are sleeping in the in the streets. Um, so they want to pass a regulation about um, lottery. Um, so again, the idea is that the planner, depending on t um, the community that he or she wants to serve, they will um, choose to work with that specific community and that obviously that assumes that planning has a particular value and also that they are serving a particular public with a public um, interest. Uh, the other planner that um, we can talk about is uh, Judith E. Ines and she argued that rational planning assume that planning was like a straightforward um, but we know that planning is um, trying to solve complex and wicked problems that is like fragmented and it plays out in a very uncertain environment so in order to uh, overcome these problems you would use collaborative decision making so that's the, to go back to the example that um, I gave of like this would be one, one planner or maybe there's planners in a different municipality and they will um, have the information that they have but if they go together with a coalition that is um, uh, discussing let's say water rights for farmers um, but also there was a coalition discussing water rights um, for um, homeowners or for businesses then um, through like collaboration, they can come up with a better way um, of serving these different um, publics. Charles uh, Lindom criticized the idea uh, similarly of um, rational planning, that uh, specifically for saying that it was um, culminating in one value, maximizing decisions. So he said that instead planning was um, incrementalist or it was um, gradualist. So in this view, instead of making big changes, uh, planners took really baby steps uh, when making decisions. So he called this like the science of modeling through uh, decision-making process. In it, policy change, it, it is understood um, more for um, the circumstances at that particular time and um, how changes happen, again, in baby steps. So there's a uh, evolution of policies um, and laws, and that planning is not really revolutionary in where things just change from the one day to, to the other. So given that technical experts, employees, and technocrats have been um, growing in numbers as the state has also been growing, um, including here planners. Um, we should add that um, also elected officials are, there's more and more every day. They, we can all classify these um, positions as like um, bureaucratic. So the idea is like how we do make the bureaucrats, um, including planners here, accountable. So when major decisions are delegated to unelected bureaucrats, how do you ensure that the will of the people is expressed in those um, decisions? To what extent do the interest of the bureaucracy itself, um, like before with a ruler, a king, or a queen, distorts or conflicts the idea of the public interest. So this is the whole basis of democracy and why public participation is um, so important. The authority to make decisions is often given to experts in uh, more modern democracies because as a society we, we, we believe um, in what they 
that, that they know, right? That they know what they're talking about because they study, um, they base their decisions on science and best practices. As a society, most of us tend to think that experts are superior in discerning what is right for society, so we delegate this power. However, most people will also agree that experts cannot make decisions without assigning a weight or a priority to those values um, that society believes that is good. These values, of course, could be very contested, so some people might believe that health is very important, some other people might believe that economic development is more important. This means that uh, the public as a whole, even with um, contradictory points of view, need to say what they value, and then uh, it will make uh, decisions based on that. In our case, planners can decide the reasonable balance point um, given the present state of, uh, of knowledge. 